my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped millions of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps, maternity compression, and lactation education and support. They take care of everything, including all paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. All you have to do is go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Extra bonus, if you use the coupon code TBH15 in their online shop, you'll get 15% off all supplies and accessories. Head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Megan all about her experience using Aeroflow breast pumps to get her breast pump for free through insurance. I'd love to take a minute to tell you about our online childbirth course called Know Your Options. This course takes you from the final weeks of pregnancy all the way through preparing for birth and postpartum, as well as a bonus course all about pumping, storing milk, and preparing to go back to paid work if that's part of your plan. You can see all the different modules laid out for you and more information at thebirthhour.com slash course. When you sign up for the Know Your Options course, you get lifetime access and instant access. So you can work at your own pace and we would love to have you join the private Facebook group for that course as well as our bi-weekly Zoom calls. So again, head over to thebirthhour.com slash course to get all of the info and use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. We'd also love to tell any new listeners who haven't heard that we have a Patreon group. You can head over to patreon.com slash birth hour to see all the information there about how to support the podcast and in return get fun perks and bonuses such as access to our archived episodes and our private Facebook group for our Patreon members. So again, that's patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's birth story guest is Nkite and she's going to be sharing her experience having a birth center birth in South Africa. Hi, Nkite. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get to your story, can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Sure. So I'm Nkite Mahale and um, I live in Johannesburg, South Africa with my husband and our nine-month-old baby girl. And I work as a valuations consultant in corporate finance. Yeah, and we've got just one child. All right. So let's talk about finding out you were pregnant and how your pregnancy went. Yes. Yeah, so we actually were married for about four years, just when we decided to start trying to conceive. And I didn't anticipate it would be hard, but it took us a bit of time to conceive, about nine months exactly. And we actually ended up like I tried I went to my gynae to see if there was anything wrong. I think I was going for my annual pap smear and I was like, hey, by the way, I'm also just trying to conceive and it hasn't happened yet. Do you think there's any reason? And he just indicated that, you know, he saw some cysts, so it could be PCOS. But he also said it could be just stress-induced, so let's give it some time. And I think he put me on inofolic, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, so I took, he was like, let's try this for about six months and see how it goes. And I tried it for like a few months and I got it impatient. And then I reached out. A friend of mine was also trying to conceive at the time. And so we were like walking this journey together. And she had heard about a homeopath and she said, you know, they could potentially help with um, just some supplements or um, that could potentially help with like restabilizing things. So when I eventually was starting to get worried, I was like, let me just try this whole homeopath thing. And I think it was literally the day when I met with the homeopath. I spoke to my friend and she told me she was pregnant. I was like, oh, wow. So maybe it might happen also for me. And literally the next month I was pregnant. So I was very happy. I couldn't believe it. And it was funny because of COVID, my first symptom uh, or sign that I was pregnant was I had a, 
like a really high temperature. I didn't feel sick. I didn't feel like I had a fever or anything, but I had a really high temperature because I was still tracking my basal body temperature. And I thought I had COVID. And so I had reached out to a friend of ours who had seen we had COVID at the time. And I was like, oh, I think I might have gotten COVID. And like, oh, I was so sorry. You know, hopefully you don't get too sick. And then I don't know what happened. I was chatting to this friend of mine like a couple of days later. She was like, how about you just try check if you're pregnant and I was like one day late and I was like I'm not doing it I've been down that road I'm not gonna test too early and I told myself I'm not testing again I think after the first month where we tried to conceive and it didn't happen and I took the test and it was negative like I'm not trying again until I'm at least like three days late or four days late and then eventually I was like ah oh, I didn't wait that long I took an ovulation test and I was like let me try that in the middle of the day see what happens apparently get a smiley if you are actually pregnant and that was the first time I was like I took that ovulation test mid-afternoon and I got the smiley I was like oh my goodness could this really be it um, and then later on I told my husband this is what's happening uh, I took this test and then he was like we're not testing too soon but I was like okay <laughs> um, I still went ahead and I took like one of these cheap tests and he had like a really, really faint line. Uh, and I told him about it. And then he was like, we're not testing again until at least let's wait two more days. So we waited two more days and we finally took the expensive clear blue, you know, tells you, I think it tells you yes or not or something like that. Um, and yeah, three days later, we took it in the morning first thing and found out I was pregnant. Um, yeah, and we were so happy. All right. So once you got the news and it sunk in a little bit, how did your pregnancy go? It actually started off quite fine, like uneventful. I thought, oh, so I'm pregnant. Is anything going to happen? And then slowly, I think a few days later, that's when I started having symptoms. And I wasn't like terribly, terribly sick. But I struggled with fatigue like right off the bat and a bit of nausea. I didn't vomit really. I think I only puked once the whole first trimester, but I really struggled with fatigue. Yeah, and nausea. Um, I managed to find like a medicine that helped with the nausea. I took something called Desilex and it really worked for me. But besides that, I struggled with fatigue up until about 20 weeks really. And it really caused like a bit of like emotional stress for me because, you know, you're not feeling very productive. And yeah, I was just have a lot of work to do, but struggling to get through it. So luckily it was towards the end of the year. So we had like our year end um, break coming up like over Christmas. So it took about two weeks off, which helped me like recuperate, came back into the new year feeling better. Yeah. And so I think Outside of fatigue, like my pregnancy was pretty fine and I was able to exercise even through like the rough days of fatigue um, and nausea until I hit around week 26. I enjoy running, so I go jogging quite often and I just started struggling with really bad pelvic floor pain. I didn't know what it was, but yeah, I went jogging once with a friend and we came back, we just started Googling and then that's when we realized that's what it was and did some stretches to try and help with that. But, you know, I, it just continued. I think I tried running once or twice after that and I decided to just write off running. And then I just stuck to swimming more. So I started swimming at the gym um, for exercise and cycling and that seemed to work and I did a bit of hit as well but thinking back to the big milestones and my pregnancy you know we went the midwife route so um, I had a gynae who I worked with but mostly I saw my midwife and I think you know she was quite helpful with asking me questions and trying to help me figure out you know what was working what wasn't what foods you know, were kind of triggering, you know, any sort of like nausea that I might have been feeling. So yeah, I had a pretty easy pregnancy aside from the fatigue, which I honestly feel like continued till after I had the baby. I feel like they need to like warn you that once you start wanting to have a baby and motherhood, that you're going to be tired for a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like years. <laughs> For a while. It's mm -hmm. the one warning that I really think was missing. Everyone tells you, you it's busy, you have a lot to juggle, but they don't mention that you just, it, you're generally tired from here on out. 
Okay, so what type of birth were you planning for and what preparation did you do? Because we tried to conceive for so long, my focus all went towards trying to conceive. And so I didn't really think much about like what kind of birth I wanted before conceiving. And I didn't really know much about what options were there. Um, And so the homeopath that I had seen, um, when I told her I was pregnant, she immediately recommended I go the birth center route. So like there's one popular one uh, in our area and actually used to practice as a gynecologist, the homeopath. So she was like, if you want to increase your chances of having a baby naturally, I'd recommend you go to this place and work with a midwife. So I trusted her. I was like, okay, let me try that. Um, and so that's kind of what led me in, down that route. But I still had to work with a gynae. So they don't have you just work with just the midwife. You have to have a gynecologist like sign you off to say you are a, a low risk pregnancy and therefore you are allowed to go like you would be able to give birth at the birth center. So um, that's the route I ended up going in. I was quite anxious. The first thing I asked her when I met the midwife was, can I have an epidural? (laughs) Um, And she was like, you don't come here for that. You should have just gone to the hospital. And I was like, what do you mean? I don't know what what you're talking about. But um, so I had to now like mentally kind of prepare myself like, what does it mean to go the route of not having an epidural and all of that? Um, but yeah, I felt like pregnancy is as long as it is to also mentally prepare you for birth if you hadn't t- thought about it. And so I felt by the time I was like, you know, heading into my third trimester, I done enough research to feel like I was actually happy to be giving birth at a birth center um, and I was happy I'd gone the midwife route especially looking at stats of um, c-sections um, you know within most hospitals that were close by and you know looking at the pros and cons of epidurals like okay I know it's possible to have it at this birth center but it is a bit more of a mission. They don't have an anesthesiologist on call like the center all the time so you need to call someone out to come and give it to you so you might take you know, 20 minutes for the person to arrive, which, you know, kind of prepared myself mentally that, you know, if, you know, I decide to go that route, it's not an easy call. Yeah, so I ended up wanting to go the um, midwife route and I wanted to have a natural birth. Um, At first, I was really fearful of giving birth, but having educated myself a lot throughout, um, I had arrived at a point where I thought it would actually be Uh, most helpful to me for my recovery to actually have a natural birth. And so I decided to try and do whatever I can, being very loose because another introduction to motherhood is the birthing process that you have no control um, even of how the birth goes. Yeah, that's the kind of birth I was hoping to have. The only thing, I guess, from my pregnancy was, you know, I became like I'm a very atypical person. So I didn't see it coming, but I ended up applying that even in the whole pregnancy and birth part or season in my life. And so I did everything that you could do. Like I had the birth ball, I was doing inversions, cat cow stretches, I went to see a chiropractor, I was like I have to have a doula. So it was very, I guess, like me to end up going that route with how my pregnancy went. So I had a timeline of like, at this point, I'm going to start taking red raspberry leaf tea. At this point, I'm going to start doing this. So I was quite obsessive really with the whole pregnancy and birth journey. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about how labor started for you. I actually had Braxton Hicks quite a lot in my third trimester. And so when I started going into labor, I thought it was just Braxton Hicks at first. Um, So I went into labor, I'd say, on Sunday evening, um, late Sunday evening. So I ended up actually waking up because I was like, okay, these Braxton Hicks are a little intense. So I was like, okay, let me just see what's going on. And I started to see they were like a bit frequent and a lot more intense. Uh, But I didn't think too much of it. Um, So I just was like, okay, let me just watch something on my phone or start preparing, doing a list of like things I still need to buy. 
Um, and I stayed up for quite a bit, you know, with Braxton Hicks slash contractions happening. And eventually I fell asleep. And then when I woke up the next morning, it seemed like I had lost my mucus plug. So I was like, okay, let me just let my midwife know that I think I might have lost my mucus plug. So, but I didn't have like intense contractions that morning. Um, they were just like, felt pretty like normal, like Braxton Hicks, but something was definitely happening. Um, so I took a shower and continued on with work. I was still working from home every day. So just went on about my day normally and didn't feel like anything was happening the rest of the day. So I thought, okay, nothing's happening. And then it started again that Monday evening. So this was like probably from about nine. Um, I started getting the contractions again and I was like, I think something is really going to happen. But um, she was, oh, by the way, it was two weeks before my due date. So our guy had kind of hinted that he doesn't see me going past 39 weeks uh, when we had gone for a 36 weeks appointment uh, because the baby's head was already uh, engaged. I think it's at like one centimeter in or something like that. And so we were anticipating that, you know, she would come early. But for some reason, I didn't think it would be that early. And so the Tuesday was going to be my last day at work. Um, So I went to sleep around nine, you know, with those contractions. But they settled and I was able to sleep fine. But ended up waking up around midnight again. And yeah, they were quite intense and, you know, happening um, frequently. And so I was thinking, okay, something is definitely starting, but I don't want to think too much about it. So I just went on my birthing ball and I was just on my phone. Um, I was actually chatting to a colleague at that time um, because I had a presentation the next morning. So I was uh, thinking, let me just um, give this person a heads up what's going on. Uh, And then I ended up being able to go back to sleep. uh, But when I woke up uh, the next morning, um, I saw like a bigger clot like on, um, and I was thinking, is this meconium? This looks really dark. I'm not sure what meconium looks like. I've heard it's dark, so I thought it was that. So a bit panicked, I called my midwife and I was like, I think this is meconium. Um, what do I do? She's like, I can't see the picture properly. I think she just come to the um, center and let's check what's going on. So I was a bit frantic. It's like, okay, we need to leave now. Um, I think we just got our things ready. And I started to feel the contractions were a lot more um, frequent. So we started actually timing them. And I think they were about 8 to 10 minutes apart um, around there. Not like very consistent in terms of time, but they were happening frequently. So we started driving off to the hospital. Um, When we got there, they actually put me on I think uh, they strapped me up so I could so they could check the contractions as well as the baby's heart rate so they let us sit there for about 30 minutes while they were checking and yeah when she, the lady came back she's like yes you've your contractions are about eight minutes apart at the moment and she did a cervical check and it seemed I was just one centimeter dilated so it's like it's still early labor prodromal labor so we can head back home but I think you should just get your stuff ready. And my husband and I are like, no, it's too soon. We've got at least a couple of days, you know, to just get ourselves together. She's like, no, I suggest you get your bag ready. Um, So we headed home and we decided to get a coffee on our way back, grab some croissants, you know, treat ourselves to a nice breakfast, thinking in case it might be a long day and kind of have it sink in. And that's when we're like making calls to our families to be like, we think it might be happening, but we're not sure. Uh, And I was still having the contractions. They were quite frequent, but not necessarily like consistent timing wise. We went back home. I tried to rest and being a crazy person that I am, I was like, let me quickly hand over this last bit of work. And literally as I was busy on the call with um, someone at work, I'd be like, okay, wait, wait, hold on a second. I've got a contraction right now. And it was with a guy. So he's just like, this shouldn't be happening. I shouldn't be hearing this. Like, you shouldn't be doing this right now. But yeah, so then uh, I wrapped up work and I decided to rest a bit. I was like, it's going to be a long day. 
And once we got um, got a nap and then we decided, okay, my husband and I, he also was just finishing off work, decided to get our stuff together. I didn't have my hospital bag ready, which was crazy. I had all my stuff, most of it, but I was waiting for my Frida Mom Amazon buy, which was supposed to come on a Friday. So in my head, I was like, she is not arriving any earlier than Friday. Um, and so I'm not packing my bag until all those things arrive. Yeah, so we had to now last minute go shop for a few things. And we also had to get tested for COVID um, in case we're going to that birth center that evening. So we decided to go shopping. Like if it's really going to happen, it'll, all this walking will move things along. If not, I'll come back home, take a bath and we'll be fine. And so we spent literally like a whole afternoon running errands. I was still shopping for last minute things. And once we got back on our way back home, we just, my husband and I like, just gonna sit down, watch the office, have dinner, and hopefully everything will be fine. <laughs> and we got back and that's what we did. We had uh, dinner and then I uh, decided I wanted to go rest and my husband would do the packing. So I handed in my phone, which had my list of what needed to be in the bags. And as I was lying down, I started to feel the contractions intensifying. Instead of settling down, it got way more intense. Um, and that's when I decided, okay, maybe I should um, let my doula know that she would come. I had been chatting with her throughout the day as well as my midwife. Uh, and my midwife had said, you know, keep me updated and um, yeah, let me know if things progress. And so after calling my doula, I called my mom and I was um, not able to bring my mom to the hospital. We could only, we were only allowed um, your one support person as well as um, you were allowed a doula. So I could take just those two people and it would be my husband and uh, my doula. So my mom was just going to come aside to labor with me um, at home. And yeah, so we had, I had my diffuser going. I was like, I'm going to try to calm down, play some music, um, see if it helps. And yeah, the contractions were just getting more and more intense. And I think about 30 minutes later, this was now like half past eight in the evening, the doula arrived and she was like, okay, let's see what I can do to help. Um, and we got on the birth ball, started bouncing on the ball and um, did that for a bit. And then she was like, let's go outside and do some squats. And I was like, is this really happening? I know I've been planning and thinking about this day, um, but I, it just wasn't sinking in that this could really be it. Yeah, and while that was happening, we were still tracking the contractions. And I think probably like two hours later or so, yeah, about half 10, these contractions are getting more intense and they're getting closer. And we decided to let me rest. And then I started feeling like I need to vomit. Uh, and then my doula was like, you know, that's usually a sign that you might be quiet for long. You might be getting close. So we decided to um, call the midwife. And at that point, my contractions were three minutes apart. So... We called and let her know, we think, you know, it might be time to go in, told her what was happening. And she was like, okay. She's like a nice old lady. And I felt really bad at 10.30 calling her, but um, felt really rude to interrupt her sleep. But I'm sure she was also just waiting to hear what was going to happen. And so we went to the hospital. Oh, I had just discovered, I think, during that time, counter pressure, how amazing it was for me. So um, my doula was doing counter pressure. So we had one meeting where we had, uh, which was the interview to meet her. And then we decided we we're going to use her. So I met her once after that, probably like 34 weeks. And we discussed my birth plan and, you know, how she would be able to help us and all of that. And so the next appointment, which is supposed to be at 38 weeks, she was going to teach my husband how to do counter pressure and all of that. But we never got to that appointment. So this was the first time I actually experienced counter pressure and it was the most magical thing for me that whole time. Uh, and so while we're in the car driving to the hospital now, my husband's like trying to do counter pressure on my one hip uh, as he's driving um, when I had a contraction, which was quite hilarious. Um, but yeah, so we 
ended up driving to the hospital, which was not too far, probably about 15 minutes away from where we stay. And uh, when we got there, we got to our room and my midwife showed up um, quite soon after that. And she strapped me up so she can check the contractions and my baby's heart rate. Um, and I think she confirmed they were quite close. I think we're about four minutes apart by then. And when she did the cervical check, she um, said I was four centimeters dilated, which for me sounded great, but obviously not as good as seven. But I was really happy that there was some progress. So it wasn't like a letdown or anything. And so uh, she's like, okay, I'm giving you two hours. You Hopefully you'll be at six. And I was like, oh my goodness, so much pressure. And um, my doula and I started going up and down in the room um, and we left my poor husband sleeping on the bed, went outside, continued our lunges, um, came back. And I think it was about two hours later and we checked again and I was actually six centimeters. So she's like, you're dilating well, but the baby's head is still high. So I was like, okay, what does that mean? Uh, but she was like, okay, let's just give it time. I'm sure it'll all be fine. And so we, at that point, I think we, she decided to um, go walking around again and we tried that. Um, and I think when we got back, I was about, I think we spent another hour or two. Um, and I was now about eight or nine centimeters. And then she was like, okay, let's uh, let you perhaps get in the bath, see if it helps. Uh, my contractions were intense, but honestly, it didn't feel like unbearable pain. Um, I also had a lot of pressure you know, in my bum area, which was so odd. But I remember listening to one podcast episode where someone also said they had a lot of like pressure in their bum area. And I was like, this is odd, but I guess since I had heard of it before, maybe it's normal. So I got into the tub to try help um, with the contractions and it was fine. I felt them getting more intense. And so I spent a bit of time in the tub and got out. My um, midwife checked me again. She's like, okay, you're still at eight or nine. Um, Let me try breaking your waters and see if that helps. Uh, And after she broke my waters, I did feel an intensity in the paint, but not the level that, you know, she was expecting because she kept asking me if I'm feeling a lot of pressure. And I was like, I am, but not like only in my bum area, really, not like in intense, you know, pressure in like my pelvic area or anything. And I was still having pretty regular contractions. And so she's like, okay, let's see. And we, she waited a bit of time. It was now like just before 4 a.m. And I was feeling very tired at this point. I was like, okay, I'm exhausted. And... She's like, you know what, let's let you rest for a bit at this point. And she's like, I'll give you a muscle relaxer and see if you're able to just get some rest. You're dilating well. Uh, And we checked the baby's heart rate at that point and it was fine. So she's like, just try and get some rest. And it's like literally as I was lying down, suddenly the contractions intensified. I like point out my doula. I was like, please come right now and do counter pressure on me while I'm lying here (laughs) and it just seemed like you know usually you get a break before that I was getting a break between each contraction suddenly like for that time it was it just didn't seem to stop and suddenly I was like screaming and I felt the intense pressure that my midwife kept asking about and it just was like something is pushing itself out of me or pulling itself out of me rather And I just heard a lot of chaos in the room. My midwife was like calling out for the other nurses. Um, I think she was like to my doula, ring the bell. And she rang the bell and she's like, the baby is coming. It's like, what? Is that what it means? I thought I was having like a bad reaction to um, the muscle relaxer that she had given me. But she's like, don't push. (laughs) Um, And then suddenly I was like, okay, I'm struggling to breathe. I just didn't know how to breathe and I had actually spent you know quite a lot of time doing breathing exercises um during my pregnancy towards the end and suddenly I just couldn't breathe and so my husband was like staring at me in the eye and just telling me to breathe like calm down breathe and I was trying I was trying to catch my breath and then eventually I sort of like gathered myself enough to like breathe in some sort of rhythm um and then I just heard my midwife say okay lie on your back 
and the atypical nerd in me who had this whole birth planned out was like I wasn't planning to give birth on my back I'm supposed to be in a different position that it's more conducive to pushing (laughs) but in that moment I couldn't see anything I literally just went on to my back and she was like okay it seems it was time she's like push um and I was like how do I push (laughs) and she's like just push how you feel like you need to push and I just started pushing and then she's like okay um stop I was like okay um, okay I'd stopped and then um she's like okay push again I think I literally I feel like I gave one strong push because after that she was like, okay push slowly and I was trying to push slowly doing short breaths and suddenly she is like handing me a baby <laughs> Um, And so from literally the moment, um, you know, I was screaming um, to the moment the baby came, it was four minutes, Um, was a really quick birth um, or pushing phase. And I literally like couldn't help it. I started like screaming. I was like, I mean, started crying. I was like, oh, my baby, my baby. Um, I thought I wouldn't cry, but here I was crying and holding this tiny person um, in my hands. Um, she didn't cry immediately, um, but I was crying enough for both of us. And yeah, and it was it, it was it and we had the baby. <laughs> I love that. I love the suddenly she was handing me a baby. <laughs> <laughs> It felt like, I don't know where she got her from. (laughs) Oh, I do remember, I do actually remember what most people say is the ring of fire. It didn't feel like sudden pain in that area, but I felt like pressure, like, okay, there's actually something. I actually thought I was pooping and I was so nervous the whole time about pooping while giving birth. I was like, I think I'm pooping. And then I wasn't pooping because then after that she gave me the baby. So... Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty common feeling, I think. But yeah, not exactly what you expect. Yeah. You think it's going to be way more painful or traumatic than it is. But honestly, I felt like that was the biggest relief throughout the whole day, that moment of pushing and having the baby come out. Yeah. I know for a lot of people, that's the case where they like finally feel like they're kind of in control of something. Mm. And then other people completely hate pushing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then how was your recovery and postpartum? So I actually, apparently the baby's umbilical cord was short. So she actually yanked the placenta out with her. So I didn't have to push anything. Suddenly the midwife was like, okay, the placenta is here. <laughs> and so after that, I didn't feel like any pain. Like I felt like everything you read about in the books about the hormones, Um, having such a crucial part in the whole process of giving birth, I felt like I lived that out because I felt pretty normal straight after giving birth. And yeah, I think from that point on, I was fine. I didn't have any issues and thankfully I didn't tear. Um, And so it also helped make recovery very easy for me. And yeah, we were in the hospital. I think my doula was with us there. And she also was, um, said she could provide lactation um, support. And so she helped me with latching the baby um, after the birth. But for some reason, I'm not sure if it was the adrenaline or the exhaustion. I thought I would like be excited for that final time to just cuddle the baby. But I was just looking forward to sleeping. So my husband did most of the skin to skin. But the baby seemed to latch fine uh, at that point. And... Yeah, we were fine in hospital, I think, until the next morning um, when we checked the baby's sugar, um, it seemed quite low. So they thought she's probably not getting enough milk from me. Um, And so they gave her formula, which we thought was fine. I was like, maybe it's just taking a bit of time. It'll come in. And the latch seemed to be fine um, when we were in hospital. So we just waited out and um, eventually get there. And I think we stayed two nights at the hospital. So left after one full day at the hospital. And when they checked her, sugar wasn't, you know, it was not going up, but it wasn't lower than what they had hoped it would be. And so we went home and we thought things would be great. Um, but then I just got this nagging feeling that I just wasn't doing this latch correctly. And I think on the Sunday, I called 
uh, asked a friend of mine if she could come over. She was bringing us a meal actually that day. And I asked if she could come a bit early so she can help see if I'm latching the baby correctly. And she helped me because she also had a baby who was like three weeks older than my baby. So she had a real life doll to practice with right next to me as we were like, you know, both trying to breastfeed these babies. And so I thought, okay, I think I'm getting it, but it doesn't seem like it's 100% there, but it seemed like it was getting better. So after my friend, just before she left, I was like, my boob just feels like it's got this rock inside, like on the side. Like, is that normal? And she was like, oh, you probably just didn't go. So just put a warm compress on it, take a shower, and it should help and just continue nursing. So I was like, okay, I think I'll be fine. And then the next morning when I woke up, my back was just like aching on the right side. Um, the right of my back was painful. It was a pain I'd never felt before. And my boob was like rock hard. And I decided, okay, I think I need to figure out what's going on. I asked a friend of mine. She was like, yeah, you're pulling goals, just try pumping. And so I would nurse and I would I started pumping. And as I was pumping, I received a message from my friend. She's like, you know, the things you're describing sounds like you might have mastitis. Just look up this, you know, read this um, post that I'm going to share with you now and check if it's not that and my heart just like I just broke down and started crying, like bawling out. It was probably, you know, postpartum hormones, but also like just from the intense pain. And I was starting to develop a fever. And I reading the symptoms, you know, that it seemed like it might have been mastitis, but I wasn't one hundred percent sure at that time. And we had a nurse friend of mine come in, um, coming to bring us a meal on that day and also told her what was going on. And she also encouraged me to just pump. And she's like, you know, you're just engorged. It happens. Unfortunately, it's going to be tough before it gets better with breastfeeding. Um, but you'll be fine. And she also tried helping me with the latch. Um, I think at this point, I hadn't yet reached out to my doula slash lactation consultant. And so I was like, okay, I'll just keep pumping. And then I just decided later, oh, yeah, and then my fever just got worse that day. The rest of the day, I just started feeling really, really sick. I took my temperature. It was really, really high. And so I went to the doctor the next day. I was like, I really think I've got mastitis. And um, my GP confirmed it was mastitis. And so she put me on antibiotics for a few days to help with that. And she's like, you know, hopefully you'll be fine. Just keep nursing. And I went back home as I'm hopefully going to be fine. But a day in of taking the antibiotics, it, it felt like the fever was better, you know, the sick feeling was better, but the boo was still not right. So I just started like reading up on mastitis a lot and they're like, you need to try to get that clog out. And I started like just pressing on my boo, pressing on trying to get that clog out. And eventually like I started to see like this yellowy milk coming out. And so I literally spent the whole day like when I wasn't nursing the baby or taking care of her, when I was in my bed, I was just pressing on my boob, trying to get that clog out. And eventually, I think after that one day of pressing on my boob to get the clog out, I started feeling much better. And it was, I think, that day, that's when I finally got a lactation consultant to come and see me. And unfortunately, she wasn't great. She was like, she saw me breastfeeding my baby, spent quite a bit of time talking, and then she saw me breastfeeding the baby, tried to help me, and she was like, no, there's something wrong with your baby. Um, she's not opening her mouth wide enough. You should take her to a chiropractor. Maybe there was something that happened to her jaw during the delivery, during the birth. You know, this sometimes happens with very fast births. It's like, this doesn't sound right. And I was very demoralized, like very demotivated after that. And I reached out to my friend and I was like, do you have another lactation consultant? I'm not happy with this one. And my friend had actually seen a lactation physio and she was like, reach out to this lady. She would be great. So I reached out to lactation physio thinking she was coming to do laser on the boob that had the mastitis. And while she was here, um, I had another friend here who was trying to help me with the latch. And she was like, oh, I'm also a lactation consultant. I can help you with the latch. And literally, like, we spent probably five minutes. She, like, held the baby, held her right. She was like, hold your boob like this, hold the baby like this, and there we go. And 
it worked, suddenly I could feel like shoot, my baby was pulling the milk differently. Like my boob, the sensation in my boob also felt differently. And we tried it a few times. She was like, okay, you try it again. She watched me feed for like probably like 20 minutes, taught me how to hand expressing. Yes, she showed me how to do that. And she's like, um, also tried doing that. And yeah, and it felt like I finally had the latch right. It was the biggest relief ever. Um, so postpartum was a bit hard for me. Like that, you know, first two weeks was really tough. In the space of one week, like the stress was so insane. My acne was terrible. I had like a blister on my tongue. My dentist said it was from stress. And my jaw like seemed to have come out of line. Like I just wasn't biting correctly just from like the intense stress. Um, and so after that happened... Uh, the lactation consultant was like, I'm going to come again tomorrow. I'll see how you're doing. And when she came again the next day, we tried. And, you know, it seemed like, you know, I, I had lost the latch a bit. Um, and she was like, okay, it's not as good as should be, but just keep trying. And we tried. And um, eventually she was like, you'll get there. Just keep practicing and you'll get it right. And she stayed in touch with me, like checked in on me, gave me a plan. And like, okay, you're going to pump after every feed. Um, to try and increase your milk, milk supply and try keep baby on the boob as much as possible. Even if she decides to want, she wants to feed for an hour, keep at it. And I think within like three days, I was feeling much better. Baby seems to be feeling better. I'm, I'm feeling more confident about this ledge. And we took her for her way in. I think um, it was a two week way in at that time. And she had gotten back to her birth weight. So we had taken her for the initial check. Um, so we do, uh, I think it's a five-day check-in with the midwife. And we had, when we had gone then, baby hadn't regained um, her birth weight. She had, Actually, she was, you know, losing weight. And so the midwife had suggested we supplement with formula because baby didn't seem to be gaining weight. And so um, we were, you know, working on this whole lactation thing and we were also supplementing with formula in the meantime. And when we went for the two-week check-in, we, you know, we realized, okay, it seems to be working. She's putting on weight. Um, and I was still pumping, so we're now supplementing with the milk I was pumping. Yeah, and I think from that point on, from two weeks, like things worked out much better. Things were going great. I, I was feeling more confident. Um, and baby seemed to also, I also felt like I could see that she was putting on weight. So it was a bit stressful, to be honest. I didn't expect to get mastitis that early on. I had read about it and heard about it during our prenatal classes, but it was something at the back of my head. Like in my mind, I was going to prepare for, you know, the whole getting breastfeeding up to speed in my last two weeks of pregnancy. But because Work was so hectic and baby came early. I wasn't on top of my game in that area. But thankfully, you know, we got right in the end and we are still breastfeeding now. And she's nine months for breastfeeding now and doing milk formula as well. Yeah, it sounds like that was quite a journey. And I know it's just like you talked about all the different indicators of how stressed you were. It's such a mm. complicated thing <laughs> that you really don't fully understand until you're dealing with it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it feels like you solve one issue and then there's a new one. Mm. And your body tells it all. Yeah. Um, you might not fully realize it, but your body shows it. Mm -hmm. It tells what you what you're going through. Yeah. All right. Well, are there any resources that you want to share? I actually really used this podcast. Like it was such a great resource for me listening Good. to other women tell their birth stories, especially because of my the initial anxiety I had around just giving birth, tearing. And so hearing birth stories made an incredible difference for me. And I also listened to a few of the evidence-based birth podcast episodes, mm -hmm. which I found really helpful just to inform myself around, you know, what to expect, the history of birthing and, you know, hospitals and what to expect really. And I also used, there's this lady on YouTube, her name is Bridget Taylor. She, like I used a lot of her videos, I found them very helpful for preparing. And for the fun of it, I also listen to Informed Pregnancy. All right. Sounds like you're a, a visual audio <laughs> learner for sure. <laughs> I definitely am. I work at a computer most of the time. I'm in Excel. And so it's nice to have something in the background. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Great. All right. So we'll put those on the show notes page. And then where's the best place for people to reach out to you? You can find me on Instagram. Uh, it's Nkite underscore. So N-K-I-T-E underscore. Um, it's a private account, but I think you can still send a message and I'll respond. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much again for sharing today. It was so great to hear your story. Thank you so much for having me. Now I'm going to chat with Megan about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor, and to get your free pump through insurance as well as other things like maternity compression garments and lactation education and support, head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. All right, let's hear from Megan. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Aeroflow. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hi, Bryn. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we get into our chat about Aeroflow breast pumps? Of course. I have three kids. My oldest is four. She was born in 2017. And then we, um, my middle is two. And then my youngest is brand new. She, he is six weeks old. All right. So tell us about how you discovered Aeroflow breast pumps and uh, why you decided to use them to get your breast pump. Well, so I discovered Aeroflow through your podcast, of course, <laughs> so, which I listen to <laughs> religiously. <laughs> um, I didn't discover, fortunately, I didn't discover your podcast until I was pregnant with my second. Um, okay. And so I started using it with with, um, with my second and then also with my third. Um, and with my first, <laughs> I of course, didn't know about Aeroflow. And so I just got the prescription from the doctor and was sent to a medical supply store, had a wait in line, was just given this like brown box. <laughs> I didn't have any choice about which breast pump I was going to get. Um, so I didn't really know any better. So when I found out about Aeroflow, um, I was like, well, it's, it's almost seemed too good to be true. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> And uh, it was awesome. So it, it, it was exactly what you said it was going to be. It was pretty incredible. That's really cool. I haven't talked to anybody who has done it without Aeroflow and with. So I'm excited to uh, hear how that was different for you. So um, for those that don't know, can you just kind of explain the process for getting your breast pump uh, for free through Aeroflow breast pumps? Sure. So I logged into the website. I typed in some of my information. I think I needed my um, my insurance information, um, due date, things like that, and then just press submit. And I think honestly, within maybe a day, maybe two days, I heard back via email and they had, they contacted my insurance company and everything. I didn't need to actually even give them a prescription. I think they contacted my midwife. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, they, first they said it was just kind of in process. And then maybe a day or two later, um, I got to access my personal page that had choices of probably a dozen different breast pumps that I had to choose from. Some were free, some were for an upcharge. So it was really cool. And then I could take the time and kind of research which ones I wanted and which ones would best suit what I needed. So it was really incredible versus my first time, which I was just literally just handed a brown box. <laughs> like, this is what you get. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, so that was really incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that they contact your care provider for you and your insurance and everything because just the last thing you want to be doing is making another call or figuring out how to fax something to somebody or whatever. So that part was really nice for me and especially that they work with um, midwives as well as, you know, a, a doctor's office or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. And I'm not um, savvy with insurance. So is any anybody, yeah. <laughs> they make my, it really hard. Not, not my jam. And so I don't even know, honestly know how they, they did it, but they did it, it yeah. again. Like, it, um, there are very few things that I try to give advice about to people who are pregnant, like pregnant ladies. <laughs> we already have too much advice that it's unsolicited advice coming in from people. Yeah. But the two things are always aeroflow and the birth hour. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> I love know. it. Because I don't think some, a lot of the people I've actually told about Aeroflow have never even heard of it. I'm like, this. you guys have to check this out. It sounds too good to be true. But really, this is what you should do. Yeah. So. Wow. I love that. Thanks for spreading the word. <laughs> yeah. Um, what pump did you end up going with for your second? And then did you get a new one for your third? I did. So this is kind of funny. So um, I... I was between the Spectra. I used the Medela with the, my first time around. And then, um, overwhelmingly advice I got was to get the Spectra, but I ended up with a Luna motif based on uh, your podcast. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
So I, I ended up with the lunar motif and I was really happy with that. And then the third time around, um, I actually did the super upcharge and got the hands-free one. Um, I think I went with the willow. Okay. Um, so I'm still figuring that one out. <laughs> but I'm, only, <laughs> I'm six weeks postpartum. So there's a bit of a learning curve with it. And so um, I'll go back to work in you know a few months. So I'll hopefully figure it out by then. Awesome. That's so funny. I think I have done the exact same path as you. I started with a Medela, and again, it was just handed to me in a brown box. And then Uh I got um, a Spectra with my second, I guess, and then um, the Luna from Motif with my third when that came out. So how um, how funny. Yeah. (laughs) And the Luna was definitely my favorite by far. So yeah, it was incredible. I know. And it was just funny because, like I said, a lot, because I think the Luna wasn't as well known known maybe as the Spectra and the Medela. Right. And so, you know, maybe I think I took it to my Facebook page, like anyone have any recommendations and like overwhelming light was the Spectra. And I was like, mm, I'm going to go with the Luna motif. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, all of the podcasts I listened to, I was like, I'm going to go with Britain's opinion on this one. And I, I was happy with it. So awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I really appreciate your time today. All right. All right. Brent, take care. Thank you so much, as always, to Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Be sure to go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started with your free and easy qualify through insurance form. Really, guys, this is the easiest way to get your breast pump. I highly recommend it. And by going to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour, they'll know that you found out about them through the birth hour. And of course, you can use that coupon code TBH15 in their online shop for any extra supplies and accessories that you need. If you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Inkite's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.